Hey everyone, Dr. Whitney Costers, Professor of English. Thank you so much for keeping with me here in this four part lecture series on Margaret Atwood's The Handmaid's Tale. Now, in the first lecture that I made in this series, which I will link below in the description box, I discuss how handmaids have historically been abused and have been silenced and marginalized in the text. Unfortunately, The Handmaid's Tale is really no different, um, especially with the historical notes and Professor Pixiato's lamentation that while he has offered dubious narrative of experiences and memories and emotions, he lacks the facts and the statistics that he needs to benefit his research. Now, the historical notes really throws a wrench in everything we've come to accept as readers of Offred's narrative. Suddenly, we realize that Offred is not going to complete her story. We will never know if she was taken by the resistance group Mayday or if she was taken to her death. That her story has been transcribed from audio tapes to paper by a male professor who now takes Offred as his subject to be dissected, questioned, ridiculed, and minimized is highly, highly problematic for several reasons. First, this is a dystopian novel which takes a woman's point of view, and not just any woman, but an oppressed, silenced woman who struggles to literally compose herself through memory, narrative, and the sharing of different versions of stories that are both true and imagined. Remember, she says, myself is a thing I must now compose, as one composes a speech. What I must present is a made thing, not something born. Offred literally must rewrite her identity after it has been robbed of her. After all, this is a story of the preservation of humanness and of survival. We see Offred seek out the things that remind her she exists, whether it is rubbing butter on her face and experiencing the sensation of it, or thinking of the word chair. I think what is so interesting and terrible about the dynamics of Offred's situation is that she was not someone who was born into a totalitarian theocracy and into this position as a handmaid. She knows what freedom is like. In fact, she took it for granted, as we probably all have at one point or another. She knows what feminism looks like based on the actions of her mother and Moira. She remembers what choice, love, family, and liberty is, and that is what makes this narrative quite compelling for me anyway. She remembers to an extent, and therefore she tries to recapture those moments or feelings. And she also must now determine how to navigate herself through a new set of laws, expectations, and acts of defiance. Remember that we, you know, she's not tempted to break the law only by Moira and other handmaids. She is asked by her superiors to break the law quite frequently, whether it's the commander, you know, taking her to Jezebel's or asking her to play Scrabble or giving her the opportunity to read Vogue, or whether it's Serena Joy asking Offred to sleep with Nick to ensure pregnancy or the doctor offering to help impregnate her, which in itself is subversive since Serena Joy and the doctor are both implicitly suggesting that the one who's actually sterile is the commander. But anyway, that's all to say that this incredibly important process by which Offred seeks out who she was and who she is, is now suddenly compromised by Pixiato and his colleague, Professor Wade, who entitles Offred's story, The Handmaid's Tale, after its homophone tale, T-A-I-L, as some sexual pun at this female writer, and Chaucer's The Canterbury Tales, a series of poems in which several travelers compete to tell the most interesting or entertaining story for a free meal. Aligning Offred's story to the Canterbury Tales and calling it a tale in the first place suggests it is more fictive, imaginative, and trivial than not. And if you know anything about the scholarship that has engulfed the Canterbury Tales, then you know it is a work, as it stands now, that has been significantly produced by scholars and editors. What the professor fails to see is that the variations of Offred's narrative are the result of what she calls a reconstruction. There are many times when she gives us versions, versions of what she hopes happened, what she envisions happening, what she thinks happened, as with Moira and Luke, for instance. She provides multiple narratives of the same situation, only later to conclude, I'm not sure how it happened, not exactly. Or she admits, the things I believe can't all be true, though one of them must be, but I believe in all of them. This reconstruction is not simply a fictive tale on par with the wife of Bath, for instance. It is in the process, the methodology, the epistemology of the reconstruction that the real significance of Offred's story lies.
by composing and reconstructing, Offred, who increasingly struggles to hold on to her past and her memories, has found a way to seek out, reconfigure, and validate her humanness, womanhood, existence, and feeling when all of it has been invariably erased by an oppressive system. Offred is teaching us one way the human psyche strives to survive under a totalitarian regime, panopticism, and the threat of death for any indiscretion or act of dissent. Offred tells us in the beginning how much she needs to believe this is a story I'm telling because then I have control over the ending. Then there will be an ending to the story and real life will come after it. It isn't a story I'm telling. It's also a story I'm telling in my head as I go along. But if it's a story, even in my head, I must be telling it to someone. You don't tell a story only to yourself. There's always someone else, even when there is no one. Offred is yet another woman who turns to the act of composing or storytelling as a form of expression and empowerment, but must still operate within the confines of limitation and anonymity that have characteristically been imposed on women writers. In Offred's case, the act of composing anticipates future readership, empathy, companionship, and thus the possibility to be acknowledged, heard, and understood. But Pixiato fails her here because none of what she offers really matters to his scholarship. He laments about her narrative. Many gaps remain. Some of them could have been filled by our anonymous author had she had a different turn of mind. She could have told us about the workings of the Glidian Empire had she had the instinct of a reporter or a spy. However, we must be grateful for any crumbs the goddess of history has designed to vouchsafe us. Pixiato and his colleagues are arrogant elitists who essentially are discrediting Offred, making fun of the underground female road by calling it the frail road, the implication being that women are frail and weak. We now know that the story we just read has been edited and interpreted by a male figure whose agenda stands in stark contrast to Offred's. Atwood gives us 300 pages of a narrative that is then compromised in the last 12 pages within the context of this academic conference. What has he done to the original text? Remember that Gilead rewrites history to fit its narrative. Does the professor rewrite hers? How much power and expression does Offred really have? And how reliable is this narrative now that you know it's been in the professor's hands? One of the things I find fascinating about this novel is how it proves, yet again, just how much history is not progressive. Gilead has essentially returned to biblical or puritanical times, and Pixiato, a scholar living in the year 2195, is guilty of minimizing The Handmaid's point of view, just as The Handmaid's Hagar, Bilpa, and Zilpa's perspectives are non-existent or heavily minimized in the Bible. Pixiato, the very man who has transcribed and studied Offred's story, still renders her somewhat unimportant and voiceless when he questions her, pokes fun at her, and wishes she had given him what he truly desires. He, like the men in Offred's narrative, wants her to fulfill only his needs. He, like Dickens' grad grind, wants the facts. Only the facts. What are the facts? Never do we see sympathy, human connection, or empathy expressed in the conference or by any of the attendees. What we do see is an effort not to judge the atrocities committed against freedom, women, and human rights. After all, Pixiato says it's not their job to judge, but they certainly have no problem passing judgment onto Offred. What we see is a world that has been, that has seen the fall of Gilead and has returned to a generally normal, and as the professor claims, a more progressive time. Yet, Atwood stirs up in us unsettled feelings as we read the sexist jokes and the various ways Pixiato and his colleagues failed to learn all the lessons we garnered from Offred's experiences. I mean, how could this guy miss them? Remember, Offred tells us ignoring is not like ignorance. You have to work at it. In other words, Atwood seems to be suggesting that while things may seem better in 2195 because Gilead has not survived, the very circumstances and conditions that made Gilead possible are still alive and well in the powerful men who control a woman's story, the men who are authoring history for the world to read and understand. With that said, I want to know what the historical notes did for, to your interpretation of the novel. What are your feelings toward the professor? How much of Offred's truth do you think we've really been privy to? Let me know in the comments below because this really changes everything. Thank you so 
much for joining me in this lecture series on The Handmaid's Tale. I do hope you found it useful and I hope that you will continue the discussion in the comments below as there really is so much more to discuss in this really beautiful yet terrifying novel. I hope to see you guys next time. Bye.